Innovation in Construction, a new podcast series by Alec, addressing some of the prevailing challenges in today's market as viewed by the industry's most respected leaders. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Alex CEO, Kess Taylor, and WSP CEO, Greg Kane. We are right now at Wanzabil on top of the Link Bridge. Welcome. Kes, I would like to start with you by discussing a topic that you have been particularly vocal about in the last few months, waste. What is waste in our industry? Can we improve it? Can we eliminate it? What's your thoughts? Okay, so I think um, construction as an industry, I think, is very inefficient. Um, if we look at our processes, and waste just isn't physical waste. It's also waste around processes, people doing things over and over and over and over again. So if we were to define, let's say, on a, on a, on a really efficient construction project, I think you would design once, you would build once, um, and, and, and you would hand over a building in a very efficient kind of a manner. Um, I think what often happens, what our industry has got into, especially in this part of the world, is um, you know we've got into shop drawings and submittals and things have to things that should happen once sometimes happen a half a dozen times or more, and this toing and froing makes it very inefficient from a, a management and a people and and actually making a project um, putting it in a position where it can get delivered on time. So there, there's massive opportunity I think for everybody in our industry to rewrite the way that we go about doing everything. But we should be doing everything once. You know, if we're going to build, um, we should build once. Um, if we build it incorrectly, it means that we've got to go and do it again. And, um, and the same from a design point of view. You know, we should all be trying to aim to do it once. And if we can do that, then we'll become super efficient. So how both of you will, will start? Where would you start to eliminate waste? So, I mean, Kez makes a good point. I mean, there's physical waste which we remove from sites every day and bring to landfill and recycling. We definitely want to reduce that. That's just a good, sensible thing to do. But then there's the waste which is around time and money and allocation of resources and just general inefficiency. I think our industry has a real challenge around integration. And I think if there's an area that we could improve, it would be better integration. The project is the sum of its parts. You know, on any one project you can have 5, 10, 15, 20 different consultants doing different things. You can have a main contractor and 5, 10, 20, however many you want, subcontractors. Then you've got material suppliers. It's all got to be brought together. And often we look at the contractor to do that, but the contractor isn't the sole integrator. That's not fair. And the client can't necessarily do it either. And the consultant is sometimes challenged to do it. So we need to find a way to integrate better is my feeling. We're not all fully connected. We don't always have the perfect alignment of interests, of, of uh, our motives are not always perfectly aligned. And we've seen examples where this has worked. You know, places like Australia, New Zealand, Alliance Contracting, where you do have a better uh, alignment of objectives, a better alignment of incentives, and therefore you have better integration and you get less waste. Now we've tried this in this region uh, 10, 15 years ago. It wasn't successful. It doesn't mean we, we can't try it again. It's just one example, but I do think integration who makes the decisions and who makes them, hopefully, as Kez says, only once, could go a long way to eliminating a lot of waste. And by waste, I, I primarily mean time, money, repeating, repeating the process. And I think if you look at our process, pretty much we reinvent the wheel over and over and yeah. over again. So we, we start a project, we go through this whole process, we get to the end of it, we disassemble the team, and then we go and we assemble a new team and we start all over again and we try and reinvent the wheel. So I think we also got to get to a point whereby we, we don't reinvent the wheel, we actually perfect the wheel. And, um, and I think by breaking these teams and assembling them, that doesn't help either. I think also modular construction, whereby it's a bit like yacht building, where you des you're constrained by what you can do and you design it once and then you try and perfect that design without radically changing it. I think what we're going to do is we're going to see a lot of efficiencies around not reinventing the wheel, that you're taking a product and you... So we're working on that at the moment um, in setting up a, um, a modular setup whereby we, we manufacture in a controlled environment and we perfect the design as opposed to going through the whole process on each project or starting from scratch. Yeah, I mean, if, if, so the ship industry has gone a long way to um, fine-tuning this. 
there's a saying in the, in the shipbuilding industry, they take four years to design a ship and one year to build it. We get one year to design a building and then we spend four years building it. And actually we don't spend a year, we spend five years designing it because of change and iterations. And then your four years of building it, you've got all your prelims, you've got everything, the, the, the non-stop cost, the non-stop effort. So we would like to see a little bit more time in the design process. In saying that, the world's got faster in everything that we do. You know, if you look at how we live our lives today versus 20 years ago, everything's faster and our expectation is faster. We go to restaurants now, we want our food in 15 minutes. We don't want to wait an hour for the food to come to the table. And our clients are putting more and more pressure on us to de deliver their projects quicker. And I understand that. You know, it's a much faster moving world. Tastes, what's suitable in the market changes. A hotel only has a, an active life these days of seven to 10 years that it needs a major uh, refurb. So I understand why clients want things done quicker. We've got to find ways to respond to that. And you talk about reinventing the wheel. One Zabil is a very, very different project to say Burj Khalifa or to say Blue Waters because that we're involved in. Yeah. They are very different projects and there's an element of the wheel does need some fine tuning as you go along. You don't want to completely re redesign the wheel, but it's not the same project every time. And sometimes we say, yeah, oh, you know, we just did this before. Why can't we do it again? Sometimes the complexity in our projects is not, I won't say it's not understood because everyone in the industry is smart but we don't give often enough due consideration for the complexity in our project and give ourselves the time to get it right. And by doing that, hopefully we'll eliminate some of the waste that we're trying to avoid. And I think around the complexity as well, I think where we end up with the best solutions and the best um, designs and the best products is if we can figure out a way of getting all the stakeholders together early. So if you as a designer are working together with us as a contractor and the specialist in formulating the method and the design. What we've seen is we end up with a much better end result if you put all those parties together um, at an early stage. You know, if, you do, if you're working in isolation, either as a contractor or as a designer, without understanding how everything's going to come together, um, we see massive value if um, in the future we can, we can bring those parties together to optimize. Uh, look, absolutely, and I think that speaks to integration because, let's be honest, designing a concrete beam is not super complex. Right? It's pretty straightforward and yeah. our guys have done it literally tens of thousands of times. Pouring a concrete beam, fair to say, is not super complex. But getting those things integrated with the ceiling, with the MEP, with the facade, with the services, with, yeah. the, services, with the interior design that the client wants to see, and all the, the door handles, the everything, the architraves, the trick there is integration, getting it all to come together. The individual parts are not particularly complex. And again, if we look at in other industries, take car manufacturing, car manufacturing is assembly. Airplanes, the, the joke of Boeing is, an airplane is just 30,000 parts flying in close formation. Yeah. But they're integrated. Yeah. So our challenge, I believe, is integration. And it goes back to if we can get stakeholders together early, get them talking to each other, getting them understanding each other, not doing it all over the world in different locations and pockets and silos. So for me, it's, it's integration, if we can bring people and teams together. So when you mean integration, collaboration, and trying to find a way to have a win-win situation at all costs. But I think maybe also on that, Deborah, as well, is you've, you've got to, you know, if you're trying to figure out if you're going to be casting a beam, and let's say we've got yeah. service penetrations that need to go through there, um, the entire project team has to understand what is the, 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 the end product that they're trying to produce. So if you're guessing what the end product is, it's very difficult to determine um, your, your service reticulation accurately. So I think we've got to understand what is the end product. So the interior designer in the case of a hotel is key. That should be defined first. And then we all work back from that and then figure out a, a solution that works seamlessly. Um, and often that end product isn't fully de defined. Um, and that affects everything you know, in reverse of that. But I think if we can get that end product resolved, then we'll end up with a, a better process. Now, I had this debate recently with a friend of mine about how the car manufacturing industry has perfected this. BMW does not start assembling a car until they know where every single part goes. And it's been designed and it's been quality tested and they've done that for four years and then they start to assemble it. Yeah. Air industry is very different and the modularization of air, what we do, is increasingly challenging because every project is different. 
And understandably, every client wants their project to be special, to be unique, particularly if it's something that they're going to try and sell in the market as, as residential or as a hotel. It's got to compete with everything else. That individualization of a project does lead to complexity. It does lead to the process continuing through the construction process. And that's fine. If that's what we're going to do, that's absolutely fine. But that will be less efficient than it could be if we took more time to define it, get it right, and then start building it. That would definitely be more efficient, but maybe would give, the, you know, give us less flexibility as we go through the process. Look, I, I think we are creating unique products. And, and to do that, I think we also, as much as we're trying to be efficient, I think coupled with that, we've got to show flexibility around making sure that we get that end product right. I think we all have a responsibility yeah. to make sure we get that right. So the BMW example is, let's call it utopia. Uh, we're all trying to get there, but I think with that, in our industry, I think we've got to have that flexibility. Yeah. Which I think we all, we all do have that. We recognize it. Yeah. yeah. What do we need to improve to ensure projects are completed on time and within budgets? Look, I think um, ultimately the client is the owner of that whole process. So how he sets a project up, who does he employ, what forms of contract do they use? Um, how do they behave? How do they resolve issues as we progress through a project? The client is the catalyst and the key for holding that whole team together. And th they perform a very, very important role in a project. And, um, and, and we are one of the components. Uh, WSP will be a component, the contractor will be a component of this overall process. But the client is key in pulling it all together. So I think uh, the client is um, the owner of that. I think as stakeholders in the process, I think there's a responsibility on us as consultants, on contractors, on the supply chain to continuously challenge ourselves, to continuously try and innovate and improve what we do. Now it's not, it's not entirely for other people to help us develop. We've got to develop, we've got to embrace technology. There is, there is an element in some respects of complacency in our industry that we've been doing things for a very long way. We are not necessarily the most innovative industry, if we're absolutely honest. We have to be frank about that. I think 2020 has shown, though, that we can all innovate. And I think it's probably the same for you guys at Alec as it is for us. We're doing things today differently than we were doing in 2019. You know, the pandemic has forced us to challenge a lot of our assumptions, a lot of our orthodoxies, and we've had to change. And so we've demonstrated that we can change. So I think we must stay on that path of continual improvement, believing we can do things better, and then we've got to show that improvement and value to our clients and then help them develop. I think to have this conversation, for it to be comprehensive, we have to talk about procurement. And our industry in the last 20 years has gone down this route of procuring typically the cheapest components. Not always, not everywhere, but more and more so. And I just don't see that as, a, that as a recipe for success. Now, I don't see buying the most expensive as the thing to do either, but I think we have to ask ourselves is continuously buying the cheapest of all the different components and then putting them together and expecting the best possible outcome the way forward. Now, I understand we're all under pressure. We're all trying to turn a profit. There's all these external factors, market factors coming at us. Running a business successfully is becoming increasingly difficult. But there's very few aspects in your private life where you buy the cheapest of everything. And I say this, you don't send your kids to the cheapest school. You don't take your family to the cheapest restaurant. You don't go on the cheapest holiday. You know, you, you procure on value. You buy what you want because it speaks to you and you see value. You don't necessarily buy the most expensive. That would be foolish. You buy on value. And we've seen this in other jurisdictions. In Europe, we have the European Un Union procures the clauses, procure for value, I think it's called, and they get to choose you know, what represents the best value. So I think we have to have an honest assessment of how we procure our projects and how we bring those things together and where do we think that that's going to lead us? Is it going to lead us to the optimal outcome? I would suggest not. No, 100%, uh, Greg, uh, we've got to we go, we, 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 we go to value the value that people bring to the party. So what would be the ideal ecosystem on a project? Look, I think um, all stakeholders have to succeed. Yeah. Okay, from client, operator, the community, the um, authorities, consultants, subcontractors, the main contractors. So 
So a great project is a project that everybody is proud of. Um, it's a project that is feasible. It's a project that is beautiful and everybody looks up to. And it's a project where everybody that succeeded on it, not just in monetary terms, but also in you know, pride of what you've been part of. Because ultimately we are a, a, a collective team of people that are putting in a huge amount of effort and energy into creating something. And um, if you can get that right, it is really important. I think you know, one of the other things is our industry um, isn't always attracting the right kind of talent because it is such a tough environment to work in. It's bureaucratic, there's rules, there's pieces of paper that you've got to fill in. Um, it's, it's, it's not a, those things that I described a little bit earlier are what we should be striving for. But we operating in an environment that people that are highly talented often look at it and say, well, I don't really know if this is my cup of tea. So I think we should be figuring out how do we attract the best talent into our industry? How do we create a great environment that people love coming to work in the morning? and they're part of great projects, they're, they're achieving great things. And um, I think we've got to work hard at that, uh, Greg, I don't know what you think. No, look, we, I think the construction industry is a wonderful industry to be in. I mean, I love it, it's tough and it's challenging, but look at what we get to do and look at what we get to leave behind each day, each week. You know, Check, Greg, we're above the clouds here. Absolutely, <laughs> looking, looking at a Dubai skyline that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. So how could you not be fulfilled by this? Do we articulate that and attract the talent um, that we can get? Now, personally, I think some of the most talented people I've come across are the people that I've worked with in this industry, in this region. So there's plenty of talent, but could we have more? We have a big drive in WSP on gender balance, on attracting more females into our business. We've made some headway on that in the last couple of years, not as much as we'd like, but you know, it's something that we're trying to push. We do a lot of work with graduates. We've just taken on now a new um, intake of graduates in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have thousands of applications for 20 spots. They start, uh, I think they start next week actually, and we'll put them through a graduate program. So we've got to invest in those people and we've got to give them a structured route into the industry, help them learn. So, so talent is, is, a, is a huge component, but I, I, I think the talent is there. Do we articulate how positive and attractive the industry can be? Maybe not. Um, you know, the, other, the other aspect for me is what is the definition of success? And I think all of us sometimes define success maybe possibly slightly too, too much on a short-term basis. This, this project will be here for 100 years. So to be in year two or three or four of it and say that it's successful or not successful or it's a failure or not a failure is a, you could argue is a slightly myopic view of the long-term success of the project. This project on a lot of these projects you see in the skyline will serve their purpose for 50 or 100 years. They'll serve a revenue model for 50 or 100 years. They'll sit on the skyline for that period. So I think the definition of success maybe needs to be pushed out a little bit longer term. Now, it goes back to my point. We live day to day. Horizons are shortening, expectations are shortening. But maybe we just need to think about a redefinition of what a successful project is and over what timeline. Yeah, I think uh, there's no doubt that uh, we do amazing projects in this re region. I think what we're talking about is coupling that with, let's call it this, um, this, this great ecosystem um, that attracts the right kind of people and, um, and you work in this um, uh, brilliant environment where uh, the bureaucracy and things like that are taken out of it. So maybe if you could couple both of those, that's like a utopia that we, we try and strive for. Yeah. I, look, time as well, you know, do we give ourselves enough time? It comes back to this point we spoke about previous. All the people I've worked with in this industry, the clients we've worked with, you know, clever people, clever organizations, capable of solving most problems. You know, if you, if you put the right people in the room, give them the tools, be clear on expectations, time and again we've demonstrated we can solve most problems if we give ourselves the time. And the more we rush things, the less time we give ourselves, the more likely we're not to solve problems optimally and then we come to site, we discover something, needs to be redesigned, needs to be rebuilt. I think I don't want to say time is the enemy, but we've got to make sure we're giving people, organizations, projects the right time horizon to be successful in. Yeah, I think change is the other thing that uh, disrupts um, all of that when you're dealing with continual flux and change. 
um, creates um, a, a lot of diverted energy and uh, and waste in the in the process. So I think if we can figure out how do we limit change, um, there, there always will be a certain amount of change on projects. But if we can limit it, it also helps. Yeah, the perfect project has zero change, but you know they don't exist. Those projects certainly not anymore. And it goes back to time. You know you can start on a project today, and their projects take three, four, five years to deliver. And in that time, what a what a an amazing interior design in a bathroom and a hotel room looks like can have changed massively. You, know, you go into a hotel that's open today versus one that opened six years ago and the interior fit out looks totally different. So our clients respond to that and we see change over the process. Yeah. And that's that's positive change. But the the, the amount that, that can be limited or minimized yeah. is in the interest of the project. Talking a little bit about Wanzabel, um, so it's a development by Isra Dubai, um, it's very exclusive, uh, a lot of milestones have been achieved already. What are we proud about? Let's start with that. Look, I think uh, technically this job is um, a technical uh, marvel. I mean, the construction challenges that all of us have faced here, whereby, I mean, especially with the link, whereby we had to construct a tower A, which we looking at behind us here and then we had to incrementally launch that across a major highway through to the other side and then using strain jacks and temporary supports to lift 8,712 tons up into position and then to weld it and connect the building. I think fr from an engineering point of view and a construction point of view it's, um, it's an amazing achievement for everybody. Yeah, I don't think you can underestimate the achievement that linking, lifting the link bridge is. I mean, it, it's a moonshot, you know, it really is a moonshot. The technical complexity of, for Alec, for constructing it, for us, for designing it, the way the towers were designed and built with lanes and pre-cambers, so when the link was lifted, they were pulled back in. You describe that to people from outside the industry who don't understand and they think you're making it up, that you would build a concrete tower with a lane and a twist. So when you lift the link, it, it pulls back in and I've sat with pieces of paper and drawn that for people so that that's not understood necessarily by everyone I think if you were to have a, a go back two three years to this project did everyone understand the complexity that was in this project and by everyone I do mean everyone I think maybe not everyone fully understood certainly for us as we've gone through this project you're doing something that's never been done before so this is not a wheel you can reinvent this is first principle stuff. There's no code, there's no textbook that our engineers could go to and go, how do you lift an 8,712 ton bridge? It's first principles, you know, it's guys in rooms really scratching their heads, solving very, very complex problems. So the complexity in this project is its biggest challenge, but obviously, or possibly also its biggest achievement, executing the complexity. Yeah, I think, I think the other thing as well, if you look at the link, um, from an architectural point of view and the way it's been designed is that you do get the perception that it's actually suspended and floating in between um, the two main towers. So although we've got this amazing engineering feat, the perception is that it's, it's suspended there and, and that is phenomenal. Yeah. That, um, we've actually managed to get the architectural intent from an engineering perspective and a construction perspective to end up with uh, that kind of a result. Yeah, there's, there's a very um, clunky uh, utilitarian version of how this link could have finished up. But what we've actually got is a very slender, very sleek, very elegant connection to the two towers. And that, the, the strength of that connection, the guys were welding cares what, six weeks, 24 hours a day? You won't quite see that complexity and that robustness when it's finished, when you drive past it. It's, yeah. it's concealed incredibly well. Yeah. Very, very elegant. Um, future trends in the construction industry. What do you think is coming up? We're, we're going to see more, more challenges when it comes to technology. So I think yeah. it goes back to innovation. You know, we are seeing an, up, an increasing uptake of technology and how we, as designers, how we design. I think that's going to continue. I think our clients' expectations from us are only going to increase, and there's a benefit to that. You know, there's a 
the more expectation you put on someone, the better they perform. So I think our clients are going to be under more pressure and then that pressure comes to us on what we can deliver, how quickly we can deliver it and for what cost. I think if we look at where this region is going, you know, we're not going to be doing more of the same. And if we look at some of the projects we're now involved in, um, particularly let's say in Saudi Arabia, they're pushing the envelope on what's possible. You know, you, you, can't, you can't reproduce what we've done for the last 15, 20 years. So the envelope's been pushed on, on the, the types of projects, the level of finish, the uniqueness that's, that's being called for. And the role of technology in that for us is increasing. So how can we design more efficiently? So one of our big pushes is digitization. How can we digitize as designers what was a manual activity two, three, five, ten years ago? So we are digitizing more and more and more. Now we're not digitizing to reduce the amount of time, to reduce cost necessarily. It's because our projects are becoming more complex. So you digitize what's not complex, and then that allows the human hand to spend more time on what is complex. And that push for digitization, to not have people spending time doing manual things, is a really big um, expectation and pressure that's been put on us. And it's not going to go away. And it's really stepped up in the last two, three, four years in particular as proprietary software. And then we develop a lot of our own software in-house. So that's going to continue. Now, I don't know if that's relevant to contractors, Maybe it is through your shop drawing process. But I think digitization is a big trend and it's only going to continue to build as a pressure for us. Look, I think um, we've got to try and simplify things more. Um, so I think, you know, if we look at specifications, preambles, drawings, um, there's a lot of conflicts that occur between all of these things. So I think what we need to do is we need to simplify it, we need to create clarity for all of the stakeholders. And, um, and actually declutter things. So I think um, th that's something that we got to do because I think we're building onto this and we're creating um, so much complexity that nobody can really figure out who's doing what. So I think taking that and simplifying it and then from our side what we're really wanting to do is, is to take things off-site. So we want to do as much as possible off-site um, if we look at this job um, at the moment on Tower A, all the vertical services have been pre-manufactured. They basically get dropped in on site. And the last time I walked around here, we were up to level 50. Um, and all our vertical services are now off the critical path. If we were doing that uh, conventionally, um, I, I think we would find that it would most probably be a constraint here. So I think we need to get smarter, we need to move things off. Um, off the site, uh, we really need to be connecting on site uh, moving into the future. And, um, and uh, modular construction, I think um, we, we're going to end up manufacturing things in a controlled environment, a bit like a car assembly line. We're then going to move it and, um, and, 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 and if, it, if it is volumetric uh, modular, they can get stacked vertically. I think what we'll be able to do is, um, is, is, is build buildings exceptionally fast and efficient. And Kez, do you have, it's not modular construction, because this is a topic that comes up a lot, and we've been, you know, as an industry, we've been looking at off-site modular for 15, 20 years, and we still haven't, maybe longer in fact, and we still haven't necessarily fully adopted and perfected it. But what you're doing for the verticals in Tower A, can you reproduce that, let's say, in a four-story hospital or a two-story airport? I mean, is it, can what you're doing in your off-site location be then changed quick enough to do it for a very different type of project? Okay, I think certain projects it's more suited to, so obviously on a high rise like this, it's very suited because you've got scale and repeatability. Um, we, we try to do that on Concourse D as well, where all the MEP was uh, pretty much manufactured in that off-site manufacturing process. But what we found is we didn't have flexibility around that. And as they changed things, that system didn't really work. So I, I think where it works is where you've got certainty. Yeah. And we don't always have certainty on projects. So if you need flexibility, it maybe always isn't the best solution. Um, but what we want to see moving into the future is um, a lot more off-site manufactured, controlled environment. And we want to minimize the amount of work that we do on a project. But that's going to affect, for instance, craneage. So we're going to need heavy lifting cranes that can lift you know, uh, into position 12 ton units um, in, in, in one shot. Um, so yeah, the whole, the whole um, logistics, um, craneage, 
and method of construction is going to change going into the future.